Well, greetings and salutations, test takers. This is Dean Tinney, a.k.a. the Series 7 Guru, coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. It looks like I need to fix my banner here to what are today today is october 3rd let's fix that on the fly there we go get that back up there and running there we go i think that's the right day been a busy 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 uh a couple weeks here uh we are doing tomorrow a live recording of episode two of our SIE pad podcast series. That's going to be on equity securities. We're breaking it up. I'm doing function two there, understanding product risk, because that's 33 questions. So we've uh, scripted already and scheduled the podcast series to run uh, equity and then debt securities and uh, options, mutual funds. Once we get that done, then we'll move on to other areas of the SIE. Uh, very pleased. Uh, Hit another milestone this year, this week. The uh, channel just crossed over 600,000 hours of watch time. That's crazy, crazy, crazy. Uh, the best free supplement to your paid study materials is my YouTube channel. But if you are looking for a paid supplement, uh, you can get 15% uh, discount from Kaplan at checkout for a QBank. Kaplan QBank would be my number one recommendation if you don't already have a Kaplan QBank. And then uh, my uh, friend Brian Lee, test geek himself, gives us a 20% discount for our viewers for his paid supplements. So if you are, are thinking about such a thing, uh, that would be the thing to do. Let us know what series exam you're taking, where you're joining us from. What we try to do is uh, deliver content from any uh, questions, content questions you have from any FINRA or NASA exam. But it's also about fun and fellowship, seeing where people are joining us from. So, you know, uh, chat amongst yourselves, do whatever you would like to do in terms of that. If you do have a question, it's helpful for me if you tell me what exam your question is from, SIE or, you know, Series 7 with a capital Q, and that way I can better pull it out of the chat. And then I'm not trying to guess, like, what exam you're taking, because, you know, I'm teaching an SIE this week, and, you know, there are a lot of content overlaps, but in terms of how it gets tested, might be different from exam to exam. So that'd be helpful. If you forget it, it's not a big deal. Uh, we uh, have this available as a podcast on both YouTube and Spotify after we're done for the evening. So uh, if you didn't catch it and you're watching the replay, you can watch it either on YouTube or you can watch it on Spotify. Uh, best way to use the channel is to find your series playlist. And SIE, there's three of them, right? They're in suggested watch order the videos. And if there's more than one playlist, those are in the watch order. And that's the best way if you want to binge on the channel. If you're trying to find particular content, uh, I would use the channel search bar. Now that would be what I'd recommend. After we get done going over content, we do a drawing for a 30 minute coaching call. I don't know, Dave, if you're here or Wendy or Cynthia, I apologize. But again, uh, paid activities always uh, take uh, precedence over non-paid activities. And I'm trying to make sure that people keep the schedule. I don't have, I can't have floating kind of contingencies where people are trying to claim a, co a, a coaching call. So in Dave's case, I've tried to schedule that two, three times. It just, you know, doesn't. Cynthia, I'll reach out to you. I'll reach out to uh, uh, Wendy and we'll try and get that done. So maybe we could do it if you're available after this evening or, you know, maybe early next week. Hopefully we get it done before, <laughs> before your exam. But we do that at the end of our sessions. All right, let's see what we've got going on in chat. Let's see what we've got going on in chat. Let me get rid of this. Do, 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 do. Boom. Let's get rid of that. Yeah, let's go see what we got. Well, thank you so much. I need a 10 because I, you know, I have a strong personality. I know you're not surprised. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And I need those 10s to kind of offset <laughs> you know, those negative fives. There you go. Thank you. All right. Love it. Test taking victory. If you have any questions, I don't know why you would take not take my word for what's on the Series 7, uh, but we have a victorious test taker in the house. Paul, thanks you so much. It means a, a lot to me uh, when people who are victorious on the test taking, uh, you know, journeys, whatever leg they're on and, you know, pop by and leave something in the comment box saying, hey, Dean, I, 
I passed or, you know, show up on the live and say they passed. I mean, we're doing a, getting a lot of people do their exams. And that's always, again, a wonderful thing. I mean, the, the channel is free, but back in the days when I would hire instructors, I don't do that anymore, but I would hire and fire instructors. And it would always amaze me when a new instructor would ask me, well, how important is it that people pass their exam? I go, well, that's very important. In fact, that's kind of the number one thing is that people pass their exam. So, Paul, thank you very much. All right, general securities principal in the house. All right, Cross. I don't know if you're aware of our Reddit community. I'm pretty proud of it. We have our series 24. It's for nines, tens, and 24s. And there's a lot of people there if you're looking for some com camaraderie uh, on that. I like it, Cross, because it's anonymous. So I'm not a model anonymous. People know who I am. But, you know, sometimes it's uh, a little easier to ask questions, if, uh, particularly in those uh, general securities principal 910 sales supervisor courses uh, anonymously. The main items, uh, a capital asset pricing model, I certainly can. So the capital asset pricing model is the underpinnings of what is called alpha and beta. That's kind of where that comes from, right? This idea of standard deviation. And so we're using the capital asset price, pricing model based on what our expectation would be of a, a securities return. And that return would be based on the beta and the risk-free rate of return, right? And the market return, right? So you know, what I'm going to do is subtract the risk-free rate of return because that's what I could get for not hazarding my capital, right? So, and then I'm going to take the market return. Again, I'm going to take out that risk-free rate of return because, again, I can get that without hazarding my capital. I'm oversimplifying this, and then I'm going to times that by the beta, and that would be my expected return. Now, I would warn you, Nathan, I think a lot of test takers on both 65 and 66 overdose on what's called analytical methods. It isn't enough to make or break you, it, but it draws people in. I don't know why. And they get stuck in there. You know, that's the present value, future value, capital asset pricing model, uh, negative correlation, all of that max, you know, four or five questions that includes balance sheet. So I would recommend that you uh, stick to uh, the, you know, broad avenues and highways of uh, that. The main point is input, output, and I just gave you the inputs, risk-free, market return, and beta. Uh, series 9 in Kinetic, all right. Would-be sales supervisor, Dave, all right. All right. I, I think, Dave, I've been trying to schedule, I think, the coaching call. I think it's you, Dave. We may have more than one Dave, but I think that's what I've been trying to schedule coaching calls. Columbus, Ohio. Next Saturday, super anxious. The 10 is a real slog, real slog. Uh, I think past perfect does go more in the weeds. So I, I, I'm okay with a 60 on past perfect and then 70s and 80s in Kaplan. I like that. Uh, I would prefer that we can push that past perfect score into the 70 range if possible. So um, keep grinding. Let's see. This is Tuesday. You're testing Saturday. So you got time for maybe a couple more practice tests. We're not trying to learn by doing practice tests. We're trying to, you know, do an intellectual inventory and see if we can do some remediation, find a few more points. Uh, but I would like to see that pass perfect. If we can get that in the 70, keep the cap on 70, 80, I think you should be in pretty good shape. Elton, welcome. Welcome. Minnesota. Well, Angela, that doesn't look like you're in Minnesota. That looks more like Mexico in that uh, picture. <laughs> I, I've been in Minnesota, and I have never seen any uh, clear water like that. South Florida, 65. Welcome, Chris. SIE from Washington. Hope you'll join us tomorrow. Uh, we're doing that SIE. It's a second episode of our podcast series. Uh, so uh, hope you'll uh, join us. Uh, that's right. Dragon Slayer. You got to get that seven done. Dragon Slayer. Miami, boy, what a group. We really have a bunch of people from all over the United States, don't we? Do we have anybody from a, a territory of the United States government? Uh, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, U.S. Micronesia. We have inter international students. Uh, Stephanie, I take my retake on SIE Thursday. This will be my second time. Or and last, and I will let it go, let be let go for my job. Uh, 
So uh, I'm overly stressed. You got, I, as we said, Stephanie, I know you're resilient. I know you're doing, you know, working hard, but you, you've got to try. Um, all you can do is what you can do. Now, I am a little different, so this might not be, again, it's a buffet. Take what you like. You know, sometimes, Stephanie, when I'm getting a little too anxious about something and, you know, like it's got, I'm going to lose my job and I'm going to find a new one. Sometimes I do a little better personally if I just take a couple minutes and say, okay, so what does my life look like if I uh, do fail this exam and I uh, do have to find another job? Let me just own that right now and then be done with it. Because the problem is if that's you're not done with that, it can distract you while you're studying. And you think you spent two hours of studying, you spent you know an hour and 45 minutes thinking about what if you don't pass and 15 minutes actually studying. So one thing I would say is we try, we've got to try as much as possible to say, okay, all I can do is what I can do. I'm going to continue to grind. I'm going to stay dedicated. I'm going to stay disciplined. I'm going to stay organized. And as they say in sports, right, leave it all out on the field. And you can't let the anxiety uh, become, or the stress become such that it's causing you to miss questions, causing you not to do all you can do to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's what I would say. I know just from uh, previous interactions with you that you're not as fragile as sometimes maybe you feel in terms of anxiety and stress. I think you are a little more resilient than sometimes you may be giving yourself uh, credit for. The pun is intended here. Don't sell yourself short, right? Now remember, you're going to go up in value, not down. So that's what I would suggest for you. Today is Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. So, you know, Thursday's coming up. So you need to get, sometimes when you're anxious, the other thing I would tell you is a lot of people say, well, get a good night's rest the night before the exam. And sometimes, you know, you're trying to do that, but you're so amped, it's hard to get a, a good night rest the night before the exam. So tonight I would say, get a good night's rest. Get a good night's rest tonight, the night before the night before. And that way, if, if you're still having anxiety and you're stressed, at least you'll be a little more rested, perhaps, than if you were counting on tomorrow, you know, uh, not doing that. So uh, that's what I would say, Stephanie. And like I say, I'll be with you in spirit. If anybody deserves to make their mark, it's certainly you. And I know how hard you've worked. And uh, I have no reason to believe that we're not going to have you circle back as a victorious test taker and say you slayed that SIE dragon. 65. Boy, lots of Florida. We've got lots of Floridians. Virginia Beach. I spent, uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, We I spent some time in Virginia Beach. Cynthia, I got to get a hold of you. So uh, I don't know if you're up to doing this, uh, uh, the coaching call. Maybe we do it. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to send you another email. We've been trying changing emails. Let's get something done and get that invite to you so we can get that done. Uh, Brian Lee is on a plane right now on his way to Las Vegas. So. Uh, who knows if he gets here soon enough, maybe he'll fire up his uh, laptop and check in with us. But he is on a flight. He has kind of a dual kind of thing going. He's got his place here in Vegas, and he's got a place in the Northwest, and he kind of bounces uh, back and forth from the two. 66, 65, wow. Uh, please comment on recruit practices of registered reps. Uh, I'm not sure what <laughs> what you mean by recruitment practices. Do you have in-depth videos on mutual funds, annuities, and suitability? I certainly do, LinkedIn user. I mean, again, what you should do is go to the channel. In the channel search bar, you can put annuities, and all kinds of content will come up. You can also put suitability, and once again, all kinds of content will come up. Uh, in terms of recruitment practices, I'm not quite sure uh, what you mean by that, but uh, you're taking a Series 6, so I wouldn't worry about it. I do have some 10s on the call and some 24s. And for you uh, men and women who are taking nines and tens and 24s, you should know that recruitment advertising is the only type of advertisement that you're allowed to run blind. Blind meaning you don't have to clearly and prominently disclose the name of the broker dealer and the address. Other than that, all advertisements must contain a clearly and prominently disclose the name. You know, so you could say for opportunities in the securities industry, reply to you know, P.O. box, whatever, you can run a blind ad. You know, most firms don't because they're proud of who they are and want to use that as part of the recruitment process. 
Uh, the other thing is you can't make exaggerated claims in recruitment ab ab advertising about income opportunities in the securities industry. You know, I was attending one of my brother's, you know, MLM network marketing seminars. And he said, you want to make rock star money? I said, Chris, you don't make rock star money. You know, Mick Jagger makes rock star money, right? So, you know, do we make good livings in the securities industry? A lot of us do, but that would be the second thing about recruitment. It's not really practices. It's more about, uh, you know, uh, you know, advertisements, you know, how you're going about that. And then, you know, we have a lot of firms who use a model where, you know, uh, there's an upline or downline uh, in terms of you, if you're making money. By the way, most of us do that as your supervisor. I typically am getting an override of what my office is doing or what my team is doing. So I uh, hope you found that helpful. Now to your other comment about suitability. I think a lot of people, you know, the three styles of questions you get on exams are recognition, practical application, and judgment. And on any of these exams, you cannot be giving up recognition questions. That's flashcard stuff. You know, it's stuff you simply know or you don't. You can't be giving up practical application questions. Again, there's no interpretation of a practical application question. Like, you know, market value at maintenance, for example. If you're taking a 10 or a 24, you should be able to do debit by 0.75, credit by 1.3. You can't be giving that up. And you want to save your misses for judgment questions. Almost every suitability question falls into this category of judgment where they give you a scenario. And then based on that scenario, you got to determine. Now, what I think most people don't do, and this is what I'm going to recommend, is I think people don't get strong enough ever on the product knowledge. And if you're not strong on the product knowledge, it's harder to answer to suitability questions because when you're strong on product, then as you go through that scenario, there'll be certain pivot words that you can say, oh, okay, well, that's now out or this one's in, right? So for example, if they say the customer wants liquidity, I go, oh, okay, partnership's out of here. You know, if they say safety of principle, I go, oh, I bet I'm looking for some kind of a government security or some sort. You know, I would almost start projecting what I think as I work my th through that suitability question, looking for those pivot words that toss an investment vehicle into the mix or toss it out of the mix. Same with uh, suitability questions about asset allocation. Usually those kind of questions like asset allocation, for example, there's usually a couple of choices that you can just toss out like, yeah, that can't be it. Right. Then you're left with a lot of these judgment questions, suitability questions are left with a 50 50. Uh, God knows you should not give up muni questions because in a muni question, it's a suitability, but it's not judgment. It's simply taking the taxable yield, uh, deducting what the amount the government's confiscating, I'm joking, taxing, and seeing out what the effective return has to be paid taxes compared to the muni. And then, you know, it's either a taxable yield or tax free. So you definitely got to get those. Those are definitely testable. And again, it's not. Uh, require any kind of a judgment. It's just the tax bracket. So you see the tax bracket, you go, oh, I know where this is going. This is going to be one of those muni questions, right? Uh, so the muni's for sure. Uh, you know, college education, I should be thinking 529s. I should be thinking uh, zero coupon bonds, perhaps, right? So that's what I would suggest in suitability. I would su suggest focus on product. Make sure you're solid on product. That goes for everybody. SIE, Series 6, Series 7. Because if you're solid on product, it takes care of a lot of problems, particularly as it relates to suitability, particularly as it relates to judgment. So hope you found that was helpful uh, in terms of uh, that question. Uh, Kaplan, a question. I tried this last week. It didn't work, uh, you know, afterwards. So I will do this uh, 152984. And what I will do, Jubilee, I like that name, Jubilee. At 1918, that's where we're at right now in the time code. In the replay, I will post a little video explication of that Kaplan QID for you. So at 1918 in the replay, replay, you will find a video. I'll look it up and I'll make a little video and I'll post it there for you. Toronto. Okay. So we got somebody from Canada. All right. Uh, past the seven last month, thanks to UNSTC. All right. So, Cody, what is your next uh, testing victory? Is your next testing victory a 63 
or a 66? What is your next testing victory? Low 80s. That's fantastic, Austin. Low 80s is great. You know, the low 80s, Austin, I'd say, gives you a margin of safety. You know, that's why I always want people to be in that, uh, you know, mid 70s, low 80s, because you have a margin of safety. Don't get me wrong. Lots of people get 60s to 70s and they still pass. But, you know, if you're between 60 and 70, you're at risk and that's not where you want to be. You're taking on Saturday. I don't think you should have any reason to fear. I don't think you're at risk. You're not at risk with those scores of those 80s. Worried about the languages? Uh, shouldn't. I don't know where this comes from, Austin. Uh, obviously, I think Kaplan's the best, but Kaplan questions are the most reflective of the actual exam. Now, I'll, you know, we're being recorded, but the predecessor company to Kaplan was a company called Dearborn. And Dearborn was bought out by Kaplan. And at Dearborn, they got so close to the actual questions that they, you know, they paid a six-figure fine for copyright infringement. You know, FINRA and NASA said that's too close, right? So when I take a test, Austin, I'd like to get to the first question. I know I know the right answer. And so you will find some Kaplan questions that are spot on. So, you know, I understand competitors probably chat up, you know, their questions as compared to Kaplan questions. Now, we have questions that Kaplan are designed to stretch your mind, but, you know, and hope it doesn't go back to the same spot. You know, we do, the Kaplan does have some gotcha questions, uh, but you shouldn't be surprised. I don't think, you know... Uh, in fact, I think the Kaplan Quebec is the best, most competitive thing about Kaplan. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I'm not a Kaplan employee. Kaplan uh, contracts with Guru Exam Prep LLC uh, to deliver some courses for them. And Guru Exam Prep LLC, the managing member is yours truly, you know, sole, sole member LLC. So, uh, but I'm not a Kaplan employee. And, you know, if I didn't think Kaplan was the best, I wouldn't be teaching classes for them and I wouldn't be selling their Quebecs. Uh, failed the 66 by five questions. Currently scoring a high 70s and 80s. Love it. Uh, good scoring for retail. I think so, Jason. Like we just said, that's where I want you to be. Yeah, low 70s. The higher the scores, the uh, more uh, margin of safety you have. Uh, I sure can. So, well, Series 10, let me start by saying, Ellen, on Series 10, as a supervisor, we're less concerned with the New York Stock Exchange as a supervisor than I am with over-the-counter trading. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's no shenanigans that take place on the New York Stock Exchange. But the New York Stock Exchange test question for everyone can best be characterized as an auction order-driven market. So what they're doing is matching buyers and sellers. Right. So I, I joke, if you're kind of a, a novice in the art market, uh, you're a novice and you're buying art in a secondary market, you might want to go to Sotheby's or Christie's because they're auction houses. They're not trading against you. They're matching buyers with sellers. They'll give you a rep that has a PhD in art history, teach you everything you want to know about art for free on the expectation you might at some point do a trade. Whereas in NASDAQ, remember, in the over-the-counter markets, NASDAQ is the preeminent, but all the over-the-counter markets, uh, we as market makers are trading against the customers. And so it's a bigger supervisory challenge to supervise the trading desk. I mean, we we do tape usually to protect us, but every once in a while, you know, tape blows up in our face. And, you know, this was a guy trader and he said, hey, I think of ours, our, our retail customers as sheep to be sheared. That is the wrong attitude. Now, in terms of participants on the New York Stock Exchange, the floor broker, again, this is testable on 7, this is testable on 10, could be testable on 24. The floor broker is the person who's responsible for executing orders for clients of member firms. So if I'm the floor broker for Morgan Stanley, it's my job to execute orders for customers of Morgan Stanley. And, you know, then there's a designated market maker formerly known as the specialist, and he has the order book. You know, stories are apocryphal, but, you know, uh, the story is, you know, I say, hey, gentlemen, I must be here every day at this post, uh, and I'm going to do specialize in Bank of New York. And if you have a limit order, you can leave it with me, and if I can get your customer his price or better, I'll do so. That'll free you up, floor broker, to go do other things. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Now, as it relates to series 10 questions, one thing that shows up on the 10 or the 24 
is I'm the floor broker and I receive an order to buy or sell. Uh, buy and sell from two different covers, customers in this example of Morgan Stanley. And so, you know, rather than working the order, I decide that what I'm going to do is a customer cross. And I'm just going to match them, poof, I'm done. And New York says, this is uh, Rule 76. You don't even know it's Rule 76. On the 10 and the 24th, they'll give you context. But what it, they say is I first, uh, first uh, offer that to the floor at a penny better to see if perhaps there wasn't better execution for my customer, right? The designated market maker, formerly known as the specialist, is the one who's charged, very testable, with maintaining a fair and orderly market. Nobody is a market maker over the counter is charged with a fair and orderly market. In fact, they would like a disorderly and unfair market. And what that means is that the designated market maker tries to make sure there's no gap in that trading. If there's a sea of sellers, then they're going to buy. If there's a sea of buyers, they're going to sell. They are allowed to trade their accounts. And then the next test question about designated market maker is I only can trade at prices better than the limit orders I'm holding. So New York prides themselves out that you might be pleasantly surprised. So you say, hey, Dean, what's going on in the auction right now, the New York? This is not a market maker. I say, oh, right now, the highest bid is 15 the lowest ass is 16. That is not like it would be in the over-the-counter markets, a market maker. No, that's uh, right now the designator market maker holding a buy limit at 15 and a sell limit at 16. And I say, hey, Elton, if you want to go to the front of the line, uh, what I would suggest is uh, put in a buy limit of 1501. You know, that's how you get the, you know, the front of the line, right? That narrows the spread. I always joke, it's kind of like if I'm uh, in line to get a muffin and there's uh, 10 muffins in the case and I'm the 11th guy, it looks like I'm not going to get a muffin. But in our business, I say, hey, uh, you're asking two, how about three? They say, come on up. And now I'm the guy who's at the front of the line. So that's how we sort that line. So the other question about the designated market maker is I could step ahead of that uh, limit at 15 and buy the stock at 1501. And whoever is at 15 complains about it. I said, well, I know what you're complaining. I was able to, you know, I gave them a penny better. So you were selling, thought you were going to get 15. I say, hey, Alan, I got the report for you. You got 1501. You go, wow, a pleasant surprise. I say, yeah, New York prides themselves on price improvement. Uh, it looks like the specialist decided to give you a higher price than the limit order he was holding or on a sell limit, a lower price. So anyways, I don't, it's kind of hard that, that, you know, these live streams sometimes don't lend themselves very well sometimes to, to that kind of a discussion. Uh, I would tell you on series 10 and 24, I would spend way more time on over-the-counter stuff that I would spend on New York Stock Exchange stuff, right? And then the other thing I would know is about, you know, you know, issuers buying their own securities, you know, because a lot of issuers have a, enough money to buy their own securities. And there would be rules about that both in NASDAQ and New York. So anyways, hope that was helpful. Yeah, Stephanie, uh, like I say, man, we're all going to be with you in spirit, right? You've got all of us. There's 32 people here. Uh, we're all sending you good energy. So I'll tell you what, Stephanie, uh, I'm going to call FINRA and I'm going to arrange for a dream draw just for you. Uh, I'm going to say, listen, you gave her a face of death draw last time. Let's give her a dream draw. Let's find out what she knows, not what she doesn't know. And I, I will do that for you. Now, if you're down there, and you know what happens? Sometimes you're taking the test, you go, oh my God, I just forgot everything. If that happens, I want you not to panic. I want you to, um, and I, Stephanie, will astro project all that back to you. Might take me a minute, might take me a minute, so don't panic. Um, and I'll say, um, um, ah, ah, you know, and boom, you know, come back to you, come back to you. All right, woohoo. Kudos, investment advisor representative. Yeah, Cynthia, I haven't forgot you. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. Indianapolis, are you, uh, you again, your, your, your private business in chat is not your private business, Diane. So you don't have to answer me if you don't want to. Uh, but uh, I spent much, uh, many, many days in Indianapolis at uh, Schwab's facility there. And uh, I don't know if it's uh, still true. But hard to believe of all the campuses, I've been to all of them. You know, back in the day, I was, a, you know, had a Schwab badge and I was on Schwab campuses uh, all the time. And uh, that guy down there makes the best breakfast burritos. Of all the breakfast burritos in the Schwab campuses, that guy is a real shorter to cook. So it, 
it's not as fancy dancy as Westlake or uh, fancy dancy as a uh, lone tree, but boy, if you want some good uh, fixings, the shorter to cook in Indianapolis at the Schwab facility is fantastic. All the following risks apply to both foreign and domestic securities except exchange risk. Well, you don't have exchange risk in a domestic security, right? You're a U.S. citizen. And as long as you're conducting business in U.S. dollars, you don't have exchange risk, right? Uh, the other risk, uh, right? So it doesn't apply to both. All the following apply to both foreign and domestic. And again, exchange risk doesn't apply to domestic securities. You're getting paid in dollars and dollars are what you need to pay your bills. Uh, other risks are repayment. Yeah, you have that in both. Well, you know, political, I, and I would like the context here, but, you know, I love my progressive friends, but, you know, God knows my progressive friends actually took control of the government. Fiscal policy, very testable in the SIE. Fiscal policy is government spending and taxation. That's a test question, SIE. And it's controlled by test question, Congress and the president. So whether that's political risk of, uh, you know, my Bernie Sanders friends or uh, whether it's in Mexico, uh, Mexico, we have a guy, uh, AMLO, Antonio Manuel Lobador, uh, Lopez Obrador, not a very capitalist friendly guy. So I would say we have political risk. Now, I know some people would disagree that, you know, we have political risk in the United States as much as others, perhaps some countries, but, you know, oh well. And then all of them have interest rate risk, right? I don't care where you're at. If interest rates are going up, your bonds are going down. Uh, now that I got my 65 under my belt, where would you recommend to look for positions in wealth management as an AIR? Jacob, I always think it doesn't matter, really. You just got to start somewhere. So I'm of the school that, you know, any job is better than no job. And I would first get a job. And then if I had pickings, you know, if I could pick, I would always in the beginning of my career, I was very fortunate. But, you know, uh, I would always pick a learning experience over money. So, you know, is this somewhere I'm going to learn? Uh, because if you learn it, then, you know, you can, if they don't pay you at some point, you go find somebody who does. So, excuse me. I'm trying to sneeze, but yeah, anyways, uh, I would take learning experience. I feel, I feel bad. I feel bad when, uh, you know, people will start out a job and then they'll, they'll, they'll tell me that they can't handle it because maybe they're, for, here's an example. Uh, I think it would be wonderful. Now, listen, I'm old and I'm I'm rich, so you know I I would never do this again. But you know, if I were a younger man, I wouldn't mind working at a a Robinhood or a Schwab or a TD Ameritrade on the phone talking to confused customers all day long, because the nature of talking to confused customer all day long means at some point I'm going to become, you know, competent, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm going to become competent, you know, way quicker than a, you know, full service broker in a sales mode where I got to go find customers. I'm almost going to be full-time prospecting. So I joke, but like if I'm at the Schwab IRA guy for a week, they say, Dean, this week you're working uh, IRA questions at Schwab. Now, by the end of the week, I'm going to be an IRA expert. So uh, again, um, but I've had people who say, Dean, I can't take it. I would, well, it is what it is. So anyways, I would say uh, learning experience, uh, people, then Jacob, I would say, you're going to spend a lot more time with people at work sometimes than even your own family. So I wouldn't want to work with people that I don't really care for or like, or don't want to spend the day with. Right. So then I would say learning experience, uh, the people I'm going to be spending time with, I think we're coming back from to the office. Right. So what are those people? And, uh, you know, like I say, then I wouldn't be too picky. I wouldn't be too picky about that. Uh, you know, um, I would think learning and people and then go from there. Yeah, exchange risk, right? Exchange risk is, for example, I own Telefonos de Mexico. Telefonos de Mexico is the monopoly phone carrier in Mexico. And they're collecting the phone bills in pesos. And let's say it used to take 10 pesos to get a buck, which it did. And now it takes 20 pesos to get a buck, which it does. So in that example, my dividend from Telefonos to Mexico got cut in half. It's not that Telefonos to Mexico changed the dividend. It's that it takes twice as many pesos to get the same level of dollars. So that's exchange risk, the risk that you can't turn the foreign currency into dollars. Now, in that example, test question. It would be not efficient for Dean to buy the foreign security in the foreign market. 
you know, I could very easily wire Mexico. Mexico City takes me all the 10 seconds and buy the Mexican security in the Mexican market. But the better way to do that is with an American depository receipt. In an American depository receipt, what I'm buying is in the foreign branch of a domestic bank. In this example, Bank of New York. There's a thousand shares of Telefonos to Mexico, which I am the beneficial owner. Now, there's a couple test questions on that. I don't know if any FINRA exam 65, 66, in which you're not getting asked about ADRs. ADRs, test questions, still have foreign currency risk. You know, Bank of New York is going to translate the accounts from Espanol to Inglés, from pesos to dollars. That's all wonderful. But at the end of the day, we're still getting pesos and turning them into dollars. And so the test question is ADRs, American Depository Receipts, still expose customers to currency exchange risk. Now, on some exams, uh, they'll refer to what we call the spot market, whatever that current exchange rate. So I just told you 20 to 1, but uh, last time I checked the spot market, it was 17 to 1. So that's exchange risk, right? Uh, you could think about it personally, right? You know, uh, to say the dollar is going up or down is a meaningless discussion unless I tell you in relationship to what. Now, if I'm traveling international and my dollar is strong, right? So, you know, I go to Mexico all the time and same deal, right? I, I have a bus that picks me up in San Diego. This thing is awesome. And it'll drive me to Ensenada. And it's beautiful. It's air conditioned. It's got Wi-Fi. This thing is fantastic. And again, based on my example, right, it used to take me 20 bucks to ride that bus. But if the peso goes to 20 to 1, now it takes me 10 bucks. It's half price for me. Now, uh, you might get tested on how that impacts uh, companies, right? And companies may have exchange risk depending on where they're doing business. Uh, I'm not sure. I think you told me what exam you're taking, but I'm not sure I need to go into like U.S. exporters, and U.S. importers and, you know, U.S. exporters like Boeing buy puts and, you know, U.S. importers like a wine merchant in New York would buy a call. But, uh, I'm not sure how, how far you want me to take that. If you'd like me to take that further, I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, no surprise. I'm struggling with options. Well, there you go. Square about. I've been watching the videos. I have lots of option videos, lots and lots of them. So they're in suggested watch order. So I can't imagine that if you watch all my videos, you're not going to be pretty good at options. It's, it's just got to... You know, I always say inch by inch options are a cinch, right? And options kind of build. So you got to get the basics down. You know, you can't be fumbling around that a short put is an obligation to buy. Contract specification. And you can track money. That's you're in pretty good shape. And uh, you're going to get on Series 7, I mean, you know, 20 options. I say 20, give or plus 5. Other people say 10, give or plus 5. Everybody has a you know number. I think it's more like 20. But what we really want to do, and some people are able to do this, is turn options into a strength. And boy, if you can earn options into a strength, that's wonderful because then you're going to dream of 125 option questions, right? I would want 125 of them. Give me, give me, give me, give me, right? So, uh, and then again, you just got to be resilient too. What happens is lights go on and they go out again and lights go on and they go out again. So <laughs> what you're trying to do in options is get, get the light lit and keep it lit and keep it lit. Well, you know, I think that's a binary thing, Angela, you should do first is look at the question and say, okay, is this a speculative option position? So I read the question once, there's no stock position. That's a speculative position. You may end up with, with the stock, but in the initial question, there's no stock. Then the second thing, you read the question and there's stock. You go, ooh. And the two stock positions you can have is long stock and short stock. And the answer is you don't always add the premium. You only add the premium if you're buying the option. So a buy, buy, you would add, or a sell, sell, right? So if I buy Apple today at 172, Angela, I buy Apple at 172. I'm long the stock, right? And now I need to decide, what do I want to do? Do I want to protect that position? You know, right now I, I see Apple saying that these new, what are the iPhone 15s or something? They're overheating. And they're telling people that it's because of I, this. Well, I don't, what do I know? Them? They said they're, uh, it's the Uber app and some other app that is uh, making the phone kind of go crazy and they're working on it. 
So maybe I say, you know what? I think I'll buy some protection. I'll buy a 170 put at uh, three. So buy, buy. I bought the stock for 172. I bought the protection for three. I'm out 175. That's my break even. But uh, you got to be careful, right? Your your point. I don't think you're seeing discrepancies. I think you you know you're not understanding, right? Because you know everybody who's a test prep vendor would not have a discrepancy here. So I say, Angela, how would you like to agree to sell high stock? You just bought low. You know, well, where does it spot Apple here at 172? And if we'll agree to sell it at 180, somebody will pay us several hundred dollars in advance to agree to sell high stock we just bought low. And in fact, we can use that premium, pay attention, to lower our out-of-pocket costs. And so we sell the 180 calls, we can get uh, seven points for that. We can get seven points to agree to sell at, at 180. Apple, we bought at 172. And uh, 172 minus seven, our break even would be 165. So there, remember buy, sell, we net. So it's buy, sell, we net. If it's buy, buy, we add or sell, sell for that example. Right, so our break even is 165 and we have three sources of profit. We can make from 172 to 180, eight points there. We get the premium, seven points there. We don't participate past the strike price, so that's not bueno. And we get any uh, dividends. Apple pays dividends, and those are ours as well. So uh, the, do you add the premium? The answer is it depends. Now, in a short stock position, right, I would want to protect that, and I would buy a call. So if I short the Apple at 172, that's money in. I buy a 175 call for three. That's money out. And then again, if it's a buy sell, I would net. So 172 minus three is 169. So anyways, hope that was helpful. I will link, uh, what was this? 4157? At 4157, I will link to the appropriate uh, lecture for you. I've got more than one, but I'll pick out one for you. And in the replay at 417, I'll put it there. Uh, stock plus options, stock plus options. Uh, for investment recommendations, the client wants income, but also conservative, uh, doesn't want to lose their investment. The answer is a CD or money market. Uh, I would say uh, CD because money market is, well, now recently it's got better, but I would have said CD, right? A CD is going to typically pay more income than a money market. Money market, I would think of as a test taker as a place for idle money. You know, ready money is a man's best friend. So if it's going to be a money market, one they like, for example, on the 65 is they like this one where um, the per your client is relocating. They sold their house and they're going to be renting and while well, they kind of discover new neighborhoods and they think in six months they're going to, you know, want to buy a new house. And then in that case, I would say money market, right? Because they said six months, but if I get them a six month CD and then they find a house they're not going to have the money available to take advantage of that, uh, you know, cash price or whatever it is. So I think on context, I would answer that. But without any further context about time horizon, uh, I would say the CD. Uh, money market, I would say, in the situation which there's a short time horizon, and it's basically money we're parking until we decide where to redeploy, right? And we would typically say to a customer, what do you want to do with your idle monies? Do you want to put it in a traditional bank account or would you like to put it in a money market fund? And for all of you, very testable. For all of you, you should definitely know money market instruments. You should definitely know T-bills. That is the best money market instrument. There's nothing better than a T-bill. Commercial paper, bankers' acceptances, and negotiable jumbo CDs. Those are the kind of things that would be fun in a money market fund. Chris, as a follow-on question, I would know that on 65, 66, and 63, that those money market instruments are typically not being sold to Joe Sixpack retail investors. And they don't need to be registered under the Uniform Securities Act. They don't need to be registered through qualification or through coordination. Uh, third try on 66, Mississippi. Wow, okay, well, you know. <laughs> The, the NASA exams, I think, are really ones that throw pe have, people have problems with, for sure. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, the Muni auction market. Well, I'm not sure if you mean like auction rate securities in Muni, Cynthia. 
Uh, we haven't had any questions in a long time on auction rate securities like variable rate demand stuff. The questions used to be about a failed auction or whether you mean where an issuer is putting out their, you know, bonds for competitive, uh, you know, underwriting. But if it's an auction market, as it relates to munis, that's usually going to be an auction rate security. And the test question is it resets to an auction process and people lost hundreds of millions of dollars. It was a major, major horror story. And that's why they put some questions. I haven't had anybody say they've seen a long time, but the test question that used to be in the QBank is about a failed auction. And now your money is locked in because you're getting nothing. You know, it's like anything that's sold. It's too good to be true. They said, how would you like to have a liquid security with a long-term interest rate? I mean, it's, it's just mutually exclusive. So not sure if that's what you mean, but uh, if so, uh, you know, let me know. Yeah, Schwab would be a fine firm. I mean, if Schwab, Fidelity, like I said, I'd be looking for a learning experience, right? And those are certainly firms where you, you know, they're they're all about, you know, learning and improving their human capital. I, I never understand why people fight that. I mean, if a firm wants to make you more valuable to the firm itself through learning, why would you want, want to do that? Because that, you know, these registrations and that learning belongs to you, right? I mean, the exams you're getting are exams that are yours. And I just never understood people who struggle with that process. I'd say, well, sign me up. Give me all the education I can. Uh, you're welcome, Upchuck. You're welcome. All right, there you go. I call that matriculation. You're you're working on your test-taking registration hat trick. There you go. I uh, recently had a, a question on Kaplan about the uh, gift tax exclusion per donor. Uh, they don't get into that on the test because they don't want to have to go in there in the QBank and change things for things that actually change in terms of money uh, taxes. I had a uh, thing here. I don't know what I did. Uh, but I have the most recent uh, part of that here somewhere. I can't find it right now. But uh, as I said, they typically shy away from that. Uh, here it is. I got it. I found it. Uh, so the uh, gift thing this year is uh, $17,000. Uh, and 401ks are twenty two five, dollars IRAs are sixty five. dollars And again, I told you, they don't like to go in the QBank and have to change things uh, like that. Well, I think you should always read the book first, cover to cover. That should be the first thing you do is a study thing. And once you've read the book, I would continually revisit you know, certain sections, certain chapters, uh, particularly the glossary, for example, uh, you know, the index, but uh, practice test, it depends when your test date is. I think seven, 10 days out, you should almost turn to almost exclusively uh, practice tests. Uh, I know you mentioned you have suitability covered. Do you have any, do you have anything I can go to and practice several suitabilities? You definitely, Carl, it's called a suitability exam. <laughs> so, if you put suitability in the channel bar, there'll be a two or three suitability exercises that will pop up. Uh, yes, Jason, when we tracked it, when we used to get scores, uh, Kaplan Masteries were on average. We don't get scores now, people who pass. But when Kaplan did get those scores, the Kaplan Mastery was anywhere from five to 12 points harder than the actual exam. So the answer to your question is yes, they are harder. There you go. Diana wants a dream draw too. I shouldn't joke because, you know, somebody's going to call for, hey, this guy's offering people dream draws and, you know, he's got somebody at FINRA who's, you know, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm just thinking about, it. I have one of my, uh, my nieces who works at FINRA. I should not say that because that would be the connection, right? Oh, she's selling the Q-Bank. <laughs> Well, again, uh, teeter-totter seesaw is what you want to get. I'll uh, link to, I have all several lectures again on this, uh, but quickly, uh, the one you need to worry about is a bond at a premium. And what you need to know about a bond at a premium is that the lowest yield is yield to call. So on a bond at a premium, we need to be able to know the yields from lowest to highest. From lowest to highest, it's yield to call. That's the lowest. And the most likely one you're going to receive because interest rates are down. And so it's very likely the issuer is going to call the bonds. 
yield to maturity, you shouldn't be quoting yield to maturity to bond to premium because I just said it's not likely you're going to get that. Very deceptive to be quoting current yield because why? You know, people don't really buy bonds for current yield. They buy them for what they are going to make either to maturity or to the call. Nominal yield. That was low to high. If we buy a bond at discount, low to high, nominal yield. Current yield, you do have to be able to crunch current yield. These other yields, you don't have to be able to crunch them. But you have to know where they are in relationship to each other. Yield to maturity and then yield to call. And again, you would quote here, not yield to call, because that's not likely. That's the highest you'd call yield to maturity. That's called yield to worst. Now, listen, I've had people even happen today. Today, this person called me out. You lied to me. You told me I wasn't going to have to do yield to call. And Dean, here's a question. Yield to call. I said, really? Well, take a deep breath. Did you try yet to do the current yield? You will know. I said, well, let's do the current yield on that bond. This is a bond at a discount. And the current yield is 6.5. Now let's shop that answer set on yield to call. And there's only one that's higher than that. So again, sometimes it looks like they're asking you to do yield to maturity or yield to call, but they're really not because you could reverse engineer it based on that relationship, right? We call that the teeter-totter or seesaw. And I will link on that. I, you will get tested on that. And the one that's very, very testable is a bond at a premium. And that's where you need to know yield to call, right? Very, very testable. I am. I'm teaching the Kaplan class. Uh, Diane Kaplan has contracted with Guru Exam Prep LLC to teach a Series 7, August 22nd through the 24th. I think that's the Monday. It's Monday, Wednesday through Wednesday. Uh, again, I'm joking. That's me. But uh, And uh, the 15% discount, Diane, if you want to join us, is Guru15 at checkout. The Guru15 discount code works for any Kaplan product or service. Uh, I have Austin. I'll link to it. I have a video I made on those changes. And you can watch that video. And I'll link to it in the replay. Uh, we The only thing that uh, people have been reporting so far, based on those cho uh, choices, that people have reported uh, questions on donor-advised funds. A, a donor-advised fund is a charitable thing. Fidelity is big on this. Schwab is big on this. They have what are called gift funds. And so rather than donating my securities to, you know, the Save the Tiger Fund, I donate the appreciated securities to a donor advised fund like the Schwab Gift Fund. And then they sell the securities. And since it's a charity, there's no tax implication. And then I direct Schwab to send that money to whatever charity I'd like them to send it to, you know, Save the Tigers or whatever it happens to be. Uh, well, Juan, we'd like to get, again, a mark, right? So... If you're testing Friday, I'm not sure what your practice test scores are. I think you maybe I think you want you put them in earlier, I think. And I think it was past perfect. You were in the 60s, and I think you were in the 70s, 80s on Kaplan. Pretty good. If you're testing Friday, this is Tuesday. So basically, you've got two more days here because you got to kind of get some sleep and rest. So uh tomorrow's Wednesday. So maybe do one more Wednesday morning. Uh maybe that past perfect. See if we can get get it to a 70 and then remediate. And then, uh, you know, uh, make sure you don't wear yourself out Thursday. You know, maybe low-key stuff, read your notes, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, there is no uh, testable difference between those. There is no testable difference between cash on delivery or payment on delivery, or for that matter, Elton, DVP, delivery versus payment. The only question about any of those, COD, PODs, DVPs, is it's not regular rate settlement. And again, these things were written before there were electronics. And so here, what we're going to do is deliver the security to the bank. The bank is the paying agent. And when I deliver the security, cash on delivery, the bank then pays me, the broker dealer, or payment on delivery or delivery versus payment. And I have as a broker dealer up to 35 calendar days to do that. It's not going to take me 35 calendar days because I want my money and I want it now. But that would be the test question. It's an aim and shoot point and click question. 
I'm not sure I understand Awesome. Oh, no, this is very testable. It's always what yields the most to the U.S. Treasury. It's last money, first money, money's out. So, Austin, I say to Coco, Coco, I say, Coco, you can't spend all that money you're making winning tennis tournaments. Uh, why don't you give me a million dollars after tax? Well, you've already paid taxes on it. We'll put it in a variable annuity. A variable annuity is a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper, and that money will go Coco uh, tax uh, deferred. And now Coco is uh, 59 and a half. And she says, hey, Dean, uh, I'd like to do a random withdrawal from my variable annuity. What's in there now? I said, well, uh, good news. There's $10 million in there. You remember the million you originally put in, you already paid taxes on, and $9 million is sitting there now that you have not paid taxes on. And she says, uh, Dean, me, send me the million I originally paid taxes on. I say, no, no, no. Coco, if I send you a random withdrawal or distribution, it's going to be last money's in, first money's out. So that million is going to be part of the nine you have not paid taxes on. You know, in these questions, you always answer what yields the most to the U.S. Treasury, right? So it's going to be done LIFO. That is very testable, very testable. That's testable. Low probability on SIE, a higher probability on uh, uh, six for sure. I think you see it. Seven for sure you're going to see it. I don't think you'll see it on 10 or 24s, but again, uh, there is definitely heightened suitability in a variable note. Yeah, that, well, it's true, Juan, but it's mainly about supervising your reps, right? So it's a little different flavor, so to speak. Hey, Marcel, woohoo! a new house. I love it. I love it. You have an extra bedroom for uh, gurus who might pop in to visit? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I will definitely tell mom you said uh, hello. Uh, yeah, Brian has uh, several. I would go all in on Brian. Brian has... Uh, a series top, top up, and you can buy things separately, all the cart, like his options. Uh, but I would go all in, and all in, you get a 20% discount, and it's about $100. Another Louisianan. Go Tigers, right? I have no no idea about what CRPC, Oscar, none. I can't imagine Kaplan doesn't have, you know, Kaplan does everything, like GMATs. I can't imagine. All right. Well, it looks like it's uh, time for our drawing. Let me get our drawing uh, thing. And boop, 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 boop. let's do this one. Let's put it over here. Let me get rid of uh, that. Um, if you haven't been with our drawing, the way we do the drawing is we pick a word. And then you put it in the chat, and then we have a randomizer kind of wheel of fortune thing that uh, picks that. Um, I'm just thinking, anybody got any ideas? Uh, I'll tell you what, in honor of our friend uh, Marcel, let's use uh, Kenner, uh, Louisiana. So, boom. Uh, put that into the uh, chat. And then let me go show you the wheel of fortune thing here. Share screen. Boom. And if you win, if you win, then just send me a email. And as I said, the will be uh, Tuesday, October 3rd at 2 p.m. And I will send you the uh, thing for that. Anybody else want to enter? We got nine entries. Okay, well, here we go. All right, Thomas, so send me an email and I will send you a Zoom invite. I'm not, Thomas, if you can't make the Zoom invite, then you need to share it with somebody that you'd like to be able to make it. I'm not going to allow any more floating kind of things on these things because it I'm backed up. You know, I, I owe Cynthia one. I owe Wendy one. And Dave, I don't know. I'm, Dave, if you're on here, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to make one more attempt to hook up with you. And then that's pretty much it. You know, we got to move on. So uh, you can share it. It will be recorded. It will be shared. So uh, anything else for tonight before we... Uh, in there.
Let me get rid of that. Uh, anything else uh, before we uh, call it a night? Okay. Well, everybody remember, inch by inch, your exam is a cinch. Yard by yard, I will. Uh, you, <laughs> your exam is hard. I'll see some of you tomorrow night for the SIE exam. And if I don't see you uh, tomorrow night for the SIE podcast live recording, we're recording live. I'll see you next Tuesday, 5 p.m. Uh, Las Vegas time.